All of the world's great religions have to answer one basic question that's been there from the beginning of time, and that is, who is a human being? And what are human beings called to do? Different religious leaders throughout the ages have had various answers to that question, who are you? There's a story told about a Lutheran bishop who was making his first pastoral call on a parish in his synod, visiting an eighth grade confirmation class. As he entered the room, tugging on his liturgical vestments and all of the things that spoke to his office, he asked the students, boys and girls, do any of you know who I am? And immediately one shoots up and says, you are a lost and condemned creature. Well, that's not the kind of answer that he was expecting. But that little girl was going to answer that question in a deeper way. She knew that who he was was more important than his office. There's an old rule in Benedictine religious communities that states simply that anyone is to be welcomed into the monastery and received based on who they are. The brothers or sisters are not to ask anything but the person's name. Who are you in terms of your name and not what do you do or where you came from or what school you graduated from or what achievements have you accomplished or what honors and how much, how much you are worth. Those questions don't matter to them. They're not important. What only interests them is who a person is and not what a person is. And who they are, they find out not based on anything about their achievements or their accomplishments or any awards they've accumulated in life. In Christian spirituality, we've answered the question, who is a human being, by asking this very simple question based on a tenet of, of Christian faith. And that is that all persons are created in the image of God, no matter if they believe it or not, if they are a person of faith or not, or whatever stage of faith they may in. Everyone is created in the image of God. That means that something of the imprint of God is in every human being. Every person has a God connection. That means, among other things, that to be created in the image of God means that a human being is free. Free to love, free to create, free to reason, and free to live in harmony with God and with all of creation. Given all of that freedom, what then are we called to do with it? That word calling in the, spiritual, uh, the Christian spiritual tradition means that one has a vocation. Vocation comes from that Latin word vocare, meaning calling. In its earliest meaning, it meant that God called a person to a particular task, a work to do. But in centuries of reflection on vocation, we have come to realize that vocation is not essentially what one does, but, what, but who one is and what one is to do with who he or she is in life. As Dorothy Day once said, one's vocation is not the thing that one does to live, but rather what one lives to do. The vocation takes the full expression of that worker's life, making full use of her spiritual or his mental or their even physical possibilities. Vocation is a larger category. Fred Beekner, another famous writer and spiritual uh, preacher, once said that vocation is a place, the place where God calls someone is that place where their deepest gladness and the world's deep hunger meets. What then are the characteristics of this vocation? First of all, we can say that vocation is huge. It's much bigger than your particular job. Your job is what you do to make a living, to put bread on the table or a roof over your house or to take care of your loved ones. Vocation, however, is a larger category. 
Vocation makes use of tasks, but it is much larger than it. When I think of vocation, I think about my father. For many years, he was an auto mechanic. And for 37 years, he owned a small business, an auto repair business in Washington, DC. I used to always think of my father as just a good auto, me auto mechanic. But now since his retirement, I've seen other things about my father. Now that he has the time, he is always fixing things around the house. He's spending more time at his church, and he is always doing things around that church to fix whatever is broken there. And even when I have a problem around my house, and I'm all thumbs, I can't figure out how to put anything together, I can always call my dad, and he can come over, and without looking at directions, he knows exactly what parts fit where, what needs to be fixed. I now know that my father, my dad, is not simply an auto mechanic. He's a fixer. He knows how to fix things. Whatever is broken, he puts it together. He can fix things not only uh, in terms of physical things or mechanical things, but even people. He has been known to fix two young boys, two sons of his growing up in Washington, D.C., and to full adults. That's his vocation. So vocations are huge. They're also holy. That is, vocations are those things that can be offered to God. Again, the vocation doesn't need to be church-related. You may readily see that mine is. My vocation is to proclaim the good news everywhere. And I was fortunate to, to get an inkling of what that vocation may be from a very young age. But vocations are rarely church-related. They have more to do with putting into perspective everything you do in life. Whether you are a lawyer or a businesswoman or someone who works at hotels, whatever job may, it may be, if you are able to, as St. Benedict once said, offer it to God as work enfolded in prayer, it can be your vocation. But vocations are not only huge and not only holy, they're in fact impossible. That is to say there's always some unfinished character to vocations. It's work that'll never fully be done. St. Paul in the New Testament was called to be an apostle to the Gentiles, and that he was. But in his career, he performed many jobs and tasks, from planting churches and pastoring them, to writing theological treatises, to making tents. But still his vocation remained. So then, how are, to you, how are you to hear the calling of God in your life? First of all, you must listen. And that listening comes from deep prayer, contemplative prayer, where we are silent before God. And if we get silent enough, we know that the Spirit can nudge you into the way that you are to go. As Antonio Machado once said, Caminante, no I camino, seace camino al andar. That is, traveler, there is no road. The way is made by walking. Thank you.